welcome everyone to the Wednesday night class. Uh, we're currently in the study of Roman, and we're uh, starting in the fifth chapter of Romans, starting with verse uh, 15. Before we get into the, our study, though, let's just have a short word of prayer. So bow with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this study of ours, and we thank you for the, thy divine word that guides our path in this old troubled world. We know that through it we have salvation, that thou has given it to us to, to lead us to home in heaven. And we're grateful for that. And we pray that our study this evening may be profitable towards that end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Uh, I might, might just say, you know, the old saying that uh, life gets tedious. Well, well it's going to get tedious. <laughs> so just bear bear with me. <laughs> it says in verse uh, 15 about the free gift, and a, and a gift is a product of favor. So the free gift is not like the offense in this trespass appears in the uh, American Standard. So the, the offense is uh, here contrasted with the free gift. It goes on to say that uh, for if by the one man's offense, trespass again in ASV, uh, many died, and it doesn't mean they died immediately, but uh, the sentence was pronounced and provision was made for the sentence to be carried out. And a relatively brief time elapsed until the sentence was carried out. Of course, you know, the uh, time is nothing to, to God. But anyway, it goes on to say much more of the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So although Adam was, was a, a type of Christ, uh, there is also a contrast the first contrast is that the free gift is not like the offense. In the offense, sin came through the one to the death of many. In the free gift, the grace or favor of God and the gift which that grace provided came by Jesus Christ and abounded to the lives of many. Not only was it uh, the grace of God and Jesus Christ, but he had reached far beyond for it was, that is, it far exceeded. He reached far beyond the effects of one man's offense. The redemption, the redemption of Christ uh, is more than countervails the sin of Adam. The uh, quote unquote abounded to many, that, that is, those redeemed by Christ inherit eternal life. <clears throat> the quote unquote, many died, uh, exclusive of the abounded to uh, may, merely inherited eternal, eternal existence, but not eternal life. You never hear of the, those lost in devil's hell as uh, uh, inheriting, inheriting eternal life. <clears throat> and just as a, a side note and comment that I think would be uh, of some uh, importance, what about those who die in infancy, uh, or more properly, before they become accountable? They die in Adam, in Adam but are made alive in Christ. What they lost unconditionally in Adam, they gain unconditionally in Christ. Now, in this respect, the saved, infants, and the wicked are all treated alike. As infants have no sins for which they must account, they are, are on equality with those whose sins are forgiven. They and the saved will be raised from the dead in spiritual bodies and share the blessings reserved in heaven for the redeemed. The wicked uh, will also be raised up 
but they'll raise up their eyes from the lake of fire. <clears throat> In the 16th verse of chapter 5, it reads, And the gift was not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came, and if you look at the Greek, uh, you know, the New King James says, which came from, but if you look at the Greek, it could be, the wording should be, or could be, was because of. So if we say for the judgment was because of one offense, it resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from, and again, the Greek uh, should not be translated was not because of. Uh, it came from any offenses, and that uh, uh, resulted in justification. In Romans, the uh, fifth chapter that we're reading, <clears throat> uh, the way the King James reads, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. <clears throat> ASV reads a little differently. It reads there, and not as though one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment came of one unto con and condemnation, but the free gift came of many trespasses unto justification. <clears throat> now, if you just read the way the Greek reads, we have to put it in order for English, but if you read it just like the Greek reads, it reads there, and not as by one that sinned the gift, or the judgment by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto justification. So the uh, different renderings of the Greek uh, uh, compared with the Greek itself demonstrates that this uh, passage is uh, elliptical. Now, when we say something's elliptical, it, it's uh, almost begging for a little more explanation. It uh, seems odd to us, but it's, uh, can be somewhat unclear to us and need more explanation. So therefore the uh, translators supplied words to make sense of it to the English reader. And this made sense to the people uh, all time. Uh, you know, that's not the problem. The problem is trying to put it in English that we understand it. So physical death came through Adam uh, and his introduction of sin pervaded all accountable persons. Actually, it, it pervaded all persons, accountable or not. <clears throat> so sin had to be punished. Therefore, uh, absent any redeeming provisions, the judgment of sin resulted in, con in condemnation. In this case, it was a sin of Adam that resulted in condemnation. And the gift was not like that at all. The condemnation came because it was merited. The gift is gratuitous. It is not merited. The one sin ended in death. The free gift came to save us from the many sins and to bring us into a state of justification. Now, this is a, another proof that God's grace through Christ it covers a greater range of evils than the one trespass of Adam. In verse 17, it says, For if by the one man's offense death reigned, and uh, that in, in the Greek is an aorist a tense, which means it's a one time deal. And usually it's in the past. And, you know, one man's offense death reigned through the one. And much more, this means much more certain, those who receive abundance of grace 
and that the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, and that's Jesus Christ. Paul has in mind here the uh, the whole period over which uh, death reigned from Adam to the time of his writing, and even to this time, it applies to us in the present. Death reigns through the one man, that's Adam, and it reigns through him now. Death reigns through none of Adam's uh, posterity. It reigns over them, but it reigns through Adam. Moreover, it reigns because of that first sin of eating the forbidden fruit. While that is certain, it is even more certain that those who receive the abundance of the favor of God's will reign in life through Jesus Christ. This abundance, however, is achieved through uh, voluntary action that is the act of the one who believes in Christ and obeys him and by no other way the ultimate gift of righteousness is forgiveness of sins if a gift cannot be rejected then it is not a gift if merited it is not a gift it is unmerited and able to be accepted or rejected. It cannot be passively accepted. It must be actively accepted. It can be passively or actively rejected. The one whose sins are forgiven is justified. While there are blessings in this life by obedience to the gospel, Paul likely is referring to the future life in heaven much more shall the redeemed reign there than in this present life of death and decay. In verse 18, therefore, as though as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. <clears throat> now the King James Version uh, reads like this therefore as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men under justification of life and then as the ASV reads so then, as through one trespass, the judgment came unto all men to condemnation, even so through one act of righteousness, the free gift came unto all men the justification of life. And again, if we just uh, look at the Greek, the way the Greek would read, uh, it, it would read this way, therefore, as by of one offense upon all men, to condemnation, so even by of one righteousness upon all men and the justification of life. And so, you know, the translators supplied some words to make it uh, clear to us in English. So after saying in the verse 12, uh, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the uh, world and death through sin, and that spread to all men because all sin, uh, that's called the protesis. You know, it's just a fancy word. Just uh, for example, if you, uh, in the phrase, if you ask me, uh, and if you ask me, I would agree that the if you ask me is the protesis. So Paul here proceeds to state the case of the one man and his sin and how that sin brought universal death. And this is called the apodosis. And if you use that same phrase before, uh, it would be the part that says, I would agree, and the, if you ask me, I would agree. <clears throat> so Paul saw and appreciated the uh, profundity of the subject 
it involved principles of uh, justice and right, uh, right, which are difficult for the human mind to, to reconcile. So the one man's offense, or, or the one offense, was that of, of uh, Adam. And what does it mean judgment came to all men? <clears throat> it was the one man's offense, uh, the first sin of Adam, by which judgment of physical death uh, came to all men. And that is the condemnation spoken about here. The same sin for which God passed judgment on Adam was the uh, same sin for which he pronounced uh, judgment on the posterity of, of Adam. Adam's posterity did not die, and we as Adam's posterity did not die because Adam's sin was imputed to us or them. We, his posterity, die because we now share his human nature. The uh, doctrine of imputed sin or even imputed righteousness, uh, for that matter, has no sanction in reason or scripture. One's goodness or evil cannot be imputed to another as if it belongs to the other. Physical death, however, is according to the constitution of nature that we oftentimes suffer or benefit from the evil or good that others do. We all recognize that. For the first sin, God condemned Adam to death. Uh, in condemning Adam to physical death, he condemned the whole of his posterity to physical death. But when it comes to eternal life, uh, you're on your own. You're not dependent upon Adam. You don't die eternally because of Adam. Now, it is admitted that our dying in Adam is attributable to his sin, uh, not because that sin was committed by us or imputed to us, but because of our relation to him in the flesh. With respect to Christ, we did not obey in his righteous act of dying on the cross, nor is uh, the act imputed to us. But Jesus Christ acted for us in the deed. And because of that sacrifice, we live. We draw death from the sin of one because of our relationship to him. And from the righteous act of the other, we draw life because of our relationship to him. And from the first, we must be born. And from the other, we must be born again. Christ took up the cross, so we must take up ours. It was by one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. This is the apotesis, uh, the apotesis uh, found in uh, verse 12 and uh, restated above that we just uh, talked about verse 15 or 16. Now, one may ask, uh, how did the free gift which came to all men result in their justification of life? Now, if the word justification here means forgiveness of sin resulting in salvation in heaven, we would have universal salvation. But this does not come to all men, but only to the obedient. However, if justification relates to the penalty imposed on Adam for that first sin, and that penalty extended to the whole human race, then justification to life removes that penalty. But we see death all around us. So how is that penalty removed? Well, there, there will be a general resurrection of all men and then the penalty of Adam will be erased. In John, the fifth chapter, verses 28 through 29, it says, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good 
to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. <clears throat> and of course, you know, the last uh, enemy will, will be death. <clears throat> In the 19th uh, verse of chapter 5, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made. And uh, if you go back and look at the Greek, that were made can be translated designated or constituted. So we could say many were constituted sinners. And so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. The first uh, one man, quote unquote, is Adam. The second one man, quote unquote, is Jesus. The disobedience, quote unquote, was Adam's disobedience in eating the forbidden fruit. The obedience was Jesus' obedience uh, by going to the cross as a ransom for the world. One becomes a sinner because of his own disobedience. Likewise, one is righteous because of his own obedience. Here in the case of the sinners and the righteous, both were made such or constituted as such. Uh, that is, it was not their acts for which uh, they were made or constituted sinners or righteous. But there's no imputation of sin or righteousness from one to another. Adam was not made a sinner. He became a sinner by his own act. But the many were made or constituted sinners by the act of Adam. And like Adam, they were subjected to physical death because of one man's disobedience. Uh, many will be made or, or constituted, if you will, sinners in the sense that they were were or uh, are subject to the same penalty imposed on Adam for his first sin because they share in his humanness. Then the verse says that because of one man's obedience, again, that is uh, Jesus going to the cross, many will be made or constituted to be righteous. The penalty of death imposed on the posterity of Adam because of his very first sin will be removed. Because of Adam, all die. Because of Christ, all shall be resurrected. To the death of Christ as a means, and because of it as a reason, the whole human race is to be made or constituted righteous to the extent and for the sole purpose of being raised from the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, chapter verses 21 and 22, it says, therefore, since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. In verse 20 of uh, chapter 5, <clears throat> moreover, the law entered that the offense may abound, might abound. For where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. The law of Moses did not enter to bring in sin, since uh, sin was already in the world. It did not enter in so that sin might prevail, since it already pre prevailed for some time. People were just as sinful before the law was given as they were after the law was given. So how did the offense abound only after the law was given? Well, the law was from God and was perfect for the purpose for which it was given. What the law did was codify law so that acts which before the law were simply unknown wrongs whereby the law determined or designated to be sin. This increased awareness of sin under a system of pure law, and that highlighted the need for the gospel. Therefore, not only did 
it'll all increase the number of identified sins, but in grace increased even more. Sin could not overwhelm grace. In verse uh, 21, it says, so that as sin reigned in death, even so great grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin's rule or, or victory is death. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death, 1 Corinthians 15, chapter verse 26. So Jesus Christ is the personal source for this grace, the means by which death's reign will end. The beginning in chapter uh, six, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that our grace may abound? Uh, what may be inferred from the previous comments? Well, if, if it's misconstrued, what may that misconstruction be? Now, continuing his sin in sin is not the occasional sin, but is the continual practice of, of it. You might say the habitual practice of sin. Paul taught uh, that we are justified by faith and not by works. Paul anticipated that some would say that the greater the sins, the greater the grace. According to the uh, thinking of some, uh, they might say, well, shouldn't we continue in sin that God's, God's grace may abandon more and more? This is not a logical, logical conclusion for, from uh, what Paul had uh, taught. Nevertheless, he anticipated this uh, convoluted thinking. So he answers in uh, verse 2. Uh, Certainly not. <clears throat> how shall we, and that's very emphatic, by the way, how shall we uh, who died to sin live any longer in it? And if we were uh, doing this in email, we'd, we would capitalize all of certainly not. It's an empathetic uh, no. His negative response is uh, supported by his uh, following comment. <clears throat> the uh, died to sin, quote unquote, is Greek errors, uh, which means it happened. Uh, it was a one time event, it, it happened. <clears throat> we died to sin uh, before we are baptized. And that dead body is buried in baptism where those sins are washed away by the blood of Christ. To die to sin is to give up the habitual practice of it. Paul here says that we died to sin. We gave up the habitual practice of it. Is it possible then to continue to habitually practice sin? In all honesty, one must answer that is that it is impossible to continue any longer in sin. That is not to say of course, that there will not be exceptions, uh, few and far between, hopefully. <clears throat> In verse three, or do you not know that as, uh, as many of us as were baptized into, and that's the ice, that's how you get into something, baptized into Christ, uh, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into, that's nice, again, saying this, Acts 2.38, where it reads there, for remission of sins. Uh, were baptized into his death. Those to whom Paul addresses this letter were baptized into Christ. And they're baptized for remission of sins. They knew it. And they knew what it meant. To be baptized into something implies that one was not in it before the event that placed, in, placed them into it. We read in 1 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 13, that we were baptized into one body. 
there's also the baptism into Moses, 1 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 2. There's the baptism into repentance, Matthew 3rd chapter, verse 11. In each case, it is to pass from something uh, into something else, something previous into something else. To be baptized into Christ is to pass from the world where he has not believed and obeyed into his kingdom, the church, which is a state of freedom from sin and a complete subjection to his will. Bapti baptism is not the only means of getting into Christ. John 3, verse 36 says that he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. We do not pass in Christ, into Christ by belief alone, however, nor do we pass into by baptism alone. Neither excludes the other, and both are alike essential to get into Christ, to get into his kingdom, the church, the body of the saved. So these things are uh, they're complementary and they uh, naturally follow one another. Paul says that the Roman brethren know that they were baptized into Christ and by that act were baptized into his death. Now that being the case, they are also dead to the world, dead to sin, that is the, the habitual practice of it. <clears throat> They are now looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of their faith, Hebrews 12, chapter verse 2. In knowledge of these facts, how can you continue to live in sin that grace may abound? You can't do it. And also keep in mind that Christ made a major transition by his death on the cross. And we should also make a major transition by our death to sin. Therefore, it says in verse 4, we were buried with him through baptism into, again, ice, into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. To be buried with him through baptism uh, suggests the, the momentary burial in water during baptism. We are then united with Christ in death and declare our separation from our former life in which sin reigned. Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of our Heavenly Father, thereby qualifying him to enter the Holy of Holies to offer his blood for our sins. We are raised from the watery grave of baptism having our sins washed away there to walk in newness of life. That is, Christ living in us and our consequential conduct. Paul is continuing to show that while we cannot continue in the, uh, the practice of sin so that grace may abound. In verse 5, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. If we should become members of his body by following him in the likeness of burial and baptism, we should also, by the likeness of our resurrection from the waters of baptism, live in the likeness of his resurrection. We are to be one with him. We are not to live the life we lived previously. We are to live a, a new life. Therefore, we cannot continue in sin, whether grace abounds or not. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Our old man of sin was done away with and buried in baptism. The body of sin is one that is given over to the practice of sin. 
that body is done away with, rendered inactive. This is, a, is accomplished by the will to keep the body of sin under control and to stubbornly resist uh, temptation by incorporating into our very being the spirit as expressed in the word of God and our appeal to God as a present help in time of need. Then the, the body of sin is done away with. The result is that we should no longer be slaves of sin. That again does not mean that no sin will be committed, but we control the, the passions and our will that lead to sin if not mastered. In verse seven, for he who has died has been freed from sin. A dead slave is no longer a slave. Likewise, he who has died with Christ is free from sin and can no longer live in sin. Also, one who has died physically is no longer subject to the temptation of sin. Therefore, he no longer lives in it. <clears throat> Verse 8, for if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Since we have been crucified, our old life of sin, when we died with Christ to sin, we should live with him, or we should live like him. He does not now live the life he lived in the flesh. He lives a new life at the right hand of God. Likewise, we should no longer live the old life of sin before we died with Christ. We should be free from sin. We should not continue in sin that grace may abound. In verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Of his own accord, Christ laid down his life. Uh, otherwise, he would not have died. Christ has been raised from among the domain of the dead by the power of God. Never again would he experience a physical death. Lazarus was raised from the dead. But he returned to that life in which uh, death still had dominion. The confidence that Christ was raised from the dead, that death lost its dominion over him, over him, gives us assurance that death will not have dominion over us if we die with Christ. The 10th uh, verse of chapter 6, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. In King James and the SB have once for all is uh, not in the Greek, at least not in the, the Greek uh, lexicon that they used. <clears throat> it goes on to read, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Christ was in his human form subjected to impulses to sin, but he didn't sin. As Peter wrote, for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in, in his mouth. First Peter, the second chapter, verses 21 through 22. And by virtue of his life in the flesh, he was subject to physical death, as are all humans. By virtue of his death, his human form was no longer subject to sin. He passed beyond the reach of sin. He could not, or he could not tempt him or cause his death. He was wholly free from his influence, which in his human form, he had never been free. He died once, never to experience the second death. And you can refer to Revelations uh, second chapter, verse 11, 20 chapter, verse 6 and 14, and 21st chapter, verse 8. Likewise, in verse 11, you also reckon yourselves to be dead 
indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, likewise, quote unquote, is a conclusion to verses 9 and 10. The Romans had been baptized in Christ, and therefore they died to sin. The purpose of the death of Christ was to deliver all who obeyed him from sin and the effects of sin. The believer's new life in Christ no longer is his, but God's. As Jesus was totally devoted to the service of his Father, so must we. All who are in Christ can consider themselves dead to the dominion of sin forever. They are alive to God by being in Christ. Consequently, if one is in Christ, he cannot continue in sin that grace may abound. Now, see, we're at the uh, bottom of the hour, so we'll conclude here and we'll begin the, uh, with the 12th verse of Romans chapter 6 uh, next week. <laughs>